Yo, Jobok, everybody! It is episode 206, the Iconicon debrief session, because whew, this weekend past was the inaugural Iconicon event, an online convention primarily, in fact, 99% hosted on YouTube at the hands of Retro Blasting, Analog Toys, and I think Two Cents Toys were also involved in the organization of it. Anyways, it was a coming together of online content creators from different walks, uh, all just chiming in about various 80s properties, genres, music, films, toys, trends, the works. It was a celebration of all things 80s, and G.I. Joburg was able to get in on the action. It was a hell of an event, and one that if you are oblivious to and you'd like to take a look at, well, guess what? It's all still there. If you didn't catch it live, it's in the can for... I'd say eternity, or as long as YouTube exists. Anyways, I've gowed on long enough. My name is Steve. I've got the usual suspects in attendance. Hello, gentlemen. Hello. I'm Paul. That was Paul, and this is Rob. Welcome to another episode. We are debriefing. <laughs> Good man. How are we feeling, Rob? Uh, you are just gave your um, movie stream, the Sly Stallone versus Arnold Schwarzenegger great movie debate, which is actually sort of the, yeah, I suppose we're going in a reverse chronology, but we'll, we'll, we'll circle back to this and, and speak about it more at length. I just want to know how you feel as of recording. It was a fantastic experience. I actually really enjoyed being able to kind of like talk about these movies with a bunch of people who seem to love them just as much as I do. Um, and I discovered a lot of movies through this experience I've never watched. Um, I think in the 80s, uh, Arnie and Stallone made about 23 movies. And there are only about eight of them that I'd never watched. So that, that's nice. pretty impressive. And you can now say uh, at the very next convention that you ever uh, sort of are involved in the organizing of, whenever that might be in sunny South Africa, um, pandemic embroiled South Africa, um, that you have been a panelist at a convention. Absolutely. Where it's going to make it a lot applause. easier to convince my bosses to put me on a panel. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, give me a panel. Feeling, man. Pretty uh, fractured right now. Paul? Me? Are you I okay? Am, yeah, well, that would, I, I don't know if you were asking <laughs> You're Rob very fractured. Me, <laughs> no, I, I wanted to know. No, bro, this is squarely pointed at you because... Um, you made yourself available to to help out on the stream that or the panel that GI Joburg hosted, and that landed it squarely at four a.m. South African Whoa. time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that was after a very particularly long day. Um, you had done a panel with Mr. Retro Blasting himself, Michael French, that same day. Yes. It's not the same day. It was the day before, but like within the same stretch of twelve hours. It's literally, yeah, like a few hours before, yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, have you yeah. recovered by now? I have mostly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's good, a it's good, a silly good. thing, but like I don't know if it's like an age thing, uh, or or what it is, but or if it's because I have like the hecticness of my day job as well. But yeah, that was a pretty busy day to begin with, and then mm -hmm. I caught a bit of a kip, and then I started rewatching. Um, and then oh yeah. Like that was also like we were signing papers and things for the house as well. So that was like happening in between everything. Then I Wait managed to get. What house like, are you talking about? What? Uh, Celia and Buying I got a house. place. Yeah, we got we got a place. We didn't buy a house per se, but we are renting. So we uh -huh. had to do all of those agreements and pass all the checks, and then we got the message that we had passed the checks and everything. So we were doing all the paperwork. Um, well, no, I lie. We were doing the paperwork to submit to get passed on the checks. So we were going through all of that and there was a lot of back and forth between Celia and myself because she was also super busy at work and she had just gotten the forms and we were like filling them in sort of on the phone and blah, blah, blah. And then, yeah, then I managed to get like an hour's nap. This was after like a busy day of work. Then I, um, and she was still at work when, when I was done with work. And then I got a, like small hours rest and I just switched on the breakfast club again to take me through to the actual <laughs> breakfast club uh, yeah. debate thing. I just wanted to just get you know some last minute pointers in and things like that and i was uh, doing a little bit of like fact checking you know just so that it was fresh in my head you know just to see if it had won any awards that kind of thing blah 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 in case that was asked or had to come up and yeah and then um it was that and then 
coming back to the whole like you know is it my age thing well uh i ate and then i i was gonna um get i tried to get a nap or whatever in and i just couldn't sleep so i was like fine then i did eventually get to sleep then i was like fine and then <laughs> i woke up at like what is it uh quarter to three in the morning and then i was up at three o'clock in the morning <laughs> and then i eagerly awaited our awesome tomahawk uh review love letter um and then straight after that we went straight into uh the gi joeberg debate thing and then i was on such a high afterwards that even though i was tired i couldn't fall asleep so i only fell asleep at like half past six in the morning you know and woke up and then woke up at like 12 o'clock <laughs> in the day 12 one o'clock yeah around damn the day. and i was trashed man i was like completely trashed i was more trashed from that than from our drinking game <laughs> <laughs> well, in that case, I'd say that uh, in spite of it being an online convention, it's still managed to approximate exactly how strung out you feel, like at a, mm -hmm. a convention weekend <laughs> where you're just overextending yourself perhaps a little bit far. But uh, let's swing back to Iconicon and first just clear the air of any, any new shit, any uh, cool happenings that have happened in the recent week. I, I have one great little uh, nugget to toss at, at anyone who <laughs> who'd like to read perhaps the most outrageous blog article ever written. This sounds so crazy. You, what did you write? It wasn't written by me. Friend of the show, Range Viper Rob, has collaborated Aww. with the Dragon Fortress and <laughs> cool. has submitted an article. Get this. This is such a hot take. Defending the Cobra Rat. Range Viper Rob actually has nice things to say about the Cobra Rat. And I think in that regard, he might be alone on the internet. It's quite possible. So, so don't take my word for it. After you're done listening to this, or <laughs> immediately uh, while you're listening to this, why not take in an article written by Range Viper Rob? It should be pretty close to the top of the um, Dragon Fortress blog feed why don't we just put a link to it in our description as well in it'll be right there and hey yeah. if you're scrolling down to the description of this youtube video why don't you leave a like bam click click doesn't take you much time and it helps the algorithm and all that groovy and all stuff. That good stuff it helps us more than and, we know <laughs> you know if you leave a review for us on any of your podcatchers in app that uh, that couldn't hurt either thanks bye cool and also just just for our uh, for our listeners um the cobra rat is that that funny little like neon orangey neon red kind of situation that shoots off the two little propellers on the side it's got those two little black propeller i things. think only one yes. of them actually shoots uh but yeah it looks like a steam iron yes it actually <laughs> kind of looks a bit like like a mouse head it's got that kind of <laughs> design if, I just wanted to make sure that everybody knows exactly what the Cobra Rat is, because as soon as you said the Cobra Rat, I was like, uh, oh, wait. And then I had to think about it, like, which one is that? Someone so, likes the Cobra Rattler? Come on. Come on. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Get out of town. Nobody likes the Cobra Rattler. Um, look, guilty pleasure of my, like, I didn't know any better. But when I was very young <laughs> and I was faced with the catalog image, which was nicely shot. I mean, it looked very wet and and swampy and dark and it kind of made the cobra rat look like a more solid vehicle than it actually was you know the, like it actually might have had an underside uh not been hollow um okay. and it also kind of the lighting made the, the red look deeper and more like a crimson it actually held some allure i was like yeah i like this i want this mm -hmm. and i was a pretty you know I was a child of modest means, and I knew that, you know, you can't roll heavy and, 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 and expect mom and dad to gift you the general if you just ask nicely. But if you ask nicely, you m might be able to squeeze the badger or the cobra rat out of them. So, yeah, that was a firm entry on my wish list. Now, thankfully, so, the badger was Check out the dragon fortress. Thankfully, they never yeah. got it for you, so that's kind of cool. <laughs> And guys, yeah. before we get the in... myth was never debunked. I never discovered exactly how hollow it was uh, until and... watching Hooded Cobra Commander's uh, review of it, which yeah, thoroughly debunks the Cobra Rat. Oh dear. So and, yeah, uh... if you want a, a two two opinions on the subject, check out Range Viper Rob's article and check out Hoodie's past review. Mm -hmm. And also, just uh, quickly before we move on to anything super serious, 
Um, did you guys get anything new this week? Mm, no, but there's no, stuff on the way. Oh, uh, that's nice. Yep, yep. That's nice. Uh, and I have a, a kind of a, a an agreement with myself to never delve into new shit that hasn't arrived yet. Ah, uh, that's smart. Yeah, I you I've know got that agreement with. I, I I normally only say it if I've got it in my hands. I try to anyway. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. you want to give an honest review of the thing, anyways. Yeah. Um. And also, like, you don't want to jinx it. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. I love it. It'll be Unless the best thing jinxed. I've ever bought. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best toy I've never had. <laughs> you know, so. Okay. So let's begin our Iconicon debrief. And well, let's was, do things chronologically, uh, if, if maybe, anyone has any objection. Maybe Paul oh, has something I, new. I got something new. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Berg. <laughs> it is it is totally a heberg thing sorry i but uh, it's it's a worthwhile thing to mention um i picked up merman and evil lynn from the he-man origin series but here's the thing and i broke a little bit of my own rule with these two toys. wet fish nice nice my <laughs> my <laughs> rob my rule with these toys is always uh, has always been to pick them up from the stores you know if i see them in the shop or whatever because that's part of the excitement of them but uh yeah i was naughty on these two <laughs> uh, a local retailer that terrible joke of like i'm on a seafood diet guys i see food <laughs> i eat it <laughs> <laughs> yeah um i've also got one of those jokes i'm just going to keep to myself because children listen to the show um anyway <laughs> um I picked up these two from a retailer in Durban. Um, it's a place, it, it's something, uh, it, it, they're trying to be cool. So they've named themselves after like the, the Fight Club um, and from the movie Fight Club, but Project Mayhem, that's what they've called themselves, Project Mayhem Toys. Wow. Um, anyway. Edgelords. They, they are such <laughs> edgelords. Yeah, like they had just opened their store um and i ordered from them and they really do need to buff up their ordering process but shame they're new let's give them a, they've only been open for like less than a month anyway i got these two figures i'm very pleased with them and i'm surprisingly super excited and very much in love with my merman figure because that what a great toy man it's so cool like it's inspired my whole uh, it's changed my whole collecting of this line to merman and the masters of the universe because he's just so great he's just such a great toy I don't know if there's many people that would say that about Merman, but I'm saying it here and now. It's a great toy. So if you guys are, are busy buying those or while you're buying G.I. Joe's and you have an extra like $12 or $14 to spare, pick up a Merman from He-Man Origins. You won't be disappointed. It's a really simple toy, but when you have it in hand, it's very special. I don't know. It just does something. Anyway, so that was my new thing. Yay. G.I. Joe <laughs> recommends Merman. Merman. <laughs> So, okay. anyway, the evil Lynn is great. Take her or leave her. You know what I mean? I think she's great, but, you know, and, you know. Anyway. And now, until back I to G.I. Joe. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, Iconicon kicked off with a opening ceremony, which was just basically a big old panel that anyone involved in the convention could attend. And, um and was invited to be included in. Uh, I was representing G.I. Joeberg for that event. And right out the gate, you're surrounded by a bunch of other channels that you know and love and have never actually had one-on-one -on -one contact with, which is already fantastic and mind-blowing. And, uh, you know, what do you say? Everyone is kind of a little bit agog and, and like, wow, you're that guy that I watch almost religiously. And now, now you're asking me about my day. Um, so <laughs> I wouldn't say it's necessarily starstruck, but it's just like, okay, so what do we talk about? And bless his cotton socks. And I, I do hope he's listening to this, but Mike French singles, um, singles me out and says, G.I. Joburg, why did you guys start doing your sketches? You're like, you know, your, your, your action figure skits. Like, what was the reason for that? And I don't think I answered you at all adequately, Mike. <laughs> like, I said something like, you know, we, we start out as a podcast, then we, 
used YouTube to do some reviews. And then we figured like uh, what could set our reviews apart is maybe just building in a few narrative sections where the toys kind of speak for themselves. And then we decided, hey, why don't we just ditch the review? But I think there's more to it than that. And mm. I think the fuller answer that I failed to give was like everyone who's a fan of action figures or dolls or role play has their own, oh, I hate this term, but headcanon. And we all have it in us to write our own fanfics. But while it might be a big step to write a fanfic, it's an even bigger step to read someone's fanfic. Like you can't really hold someone down and force feed them your work of fiction. None of us are published authors. None of us necessarily have a reputation that we can, we can ride on. So how do you make these stories? How do you make your presentation of your imagination palatable? Well, you make a movie out of it. And I think that's, that's kind of how, how, how this has evolved. Like, I'm like, I want to tell my stories. I, I think they're worthy of being told. Like they are a, a hybrid of, of all the things that I love about GI Joe, like be it elements from the comic book, be it the odd element that I like from the cartoon series, like throw them into a melting pot and, and make these action figures walk and talk and speak for themselves. That's, I think that's probably the truest answer. Like, this is how I play now. I need this. And also, I think it's worth mentioning, and, and just to just add a little bit to that backstory. I mean, they were, uh, when we did the Phantom X-90, uh, there was, or X-19, not X-90, Paul. Anyway, when we did that, uh, you know. <laughs> the very first G.I. Joburg review, which was released started... second because Paul was sitting on the footage. Yeah, yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah, no, like, <laughs> there you go, gentlemen <laughs> and ladies. The truth will out. Um, but then also there were these little skits that you did at the end of that re um they were like tiny you know there were these tiny little skits that started coming into the reviews anyway and uh as i recall you were having more fun doing that and then at some point we went and shot that condor as well um yeah we went to go and shoot the condor and On we were North also Cliff, having... and and you were you were freaking out that we'd get mugged and well, i was like yeah, none the wise i was just like oh, this is fun well it's 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 a worthwhile concern. I mean, South Africa, but uh, <laughs> not just. It's also Joburg, and it's also North Cliff Hill, which is known for that kind of thing. Although not so much now. Thankfully, they've cleaned it up. Anyway, long story short, we started shooting that, and the point where it had to become a review, we were like, I remember going, oh, now we have to also like shoot this thing and like as if it's being reviewed, which you championed, by the way. I mean, you did a, a great job of that portion of it, but we had so much fun shooting the action sequence for it that it actually also sort of spiraled in that was also one of the i would say part of the genesis of the the play motion stuff as well which was cool. yeah credit where credit's due paul you were the one who convinced me like let's just re release the battle sequence as its own thing so that was yeah. the start of that and then yeah, the, kind of the, like a trailer. the further yeah. i suppose the further evolution of that was like rob and i went out one day with every intention of shooting a full review and then we just stopped short of actually shooting the review. We shot the sort of the narrative sections and just kind of wove the review into it. Um, yeah. And it really was just an excuse to, to string up the tactical battle platform onto f three dragonflies and a core helicopter. Yeah. Can it be uh, done? It can. can it Amazing. Be done? And then, Amazing. you know, it, the rest was a review sort of guided tour by shipwreck. So, you know, it, it's a yeah. very kind of like, um, you know, without breaking the fourth wall completely, he's very much saying like, barbecue, bring the uh, crane online, like stuff like that, you know, like it was, it was clearly like showing off the features of the playset without breaking yeah. character. There was yeah, no like narration putting... saying, and you can find four air to surface missiles over here, like whatever. Exactly. And it's like, it's like putting a Coca-Cola vending machine in Terminator 2, you know? And that's yeah, when the one famous scene get down, <laughs> um, but I don't want to dwell on it too much. Yeah, it's I know, been a great know, ride, I, and, and it's certainly but been I was a fantastic there. further evolution from there. Um, yeah. And putting putting us back onto the Iconicon trail, the very next thing that happened that involved GI Joeberg was your involvement, Paul, was it not? Yeah, for for Iconicon. Yeah, geez, dude, um, I had to do. I was part of the horror panel, <laughs> which yeah, was man. like. Spooky. unbelievably nerve-wracking let me put that out there 
I, I don't know if the listeners want to hear about that right now, but wow, that was unbelievably, uh, unbelievably nerve-wracking because, Stephen, I saw you that morning. I was watching you. I unfortunately couldn't participate in that because I had to be sort of on standby with meetings. So I actually had that whole thing playing through um, my earphones, my one earphone, <laughs> and then I had the meeting that I was paying attention to on my other earphone because I can split mm -hmm. my side card. Yay! Anyway, um, I know more <laughs> about what happened in that opening ceremony than I did with um, my meeting because it was like there could have been an email anyway. Anyway, long story short, uh, I just want to just echo that sentiment of like being surrounded by people that you watch on YouTube a lot and then you finally get to meet them and how it's like it's kind of daunting. Um, I also want to like add to that when you meet a whole bunch of people in a panel that you know are from YouTube channels, but you haven't met them. That's also pretty daunting because <laughs> you don't know who they are, you know. Um, so they're earning their spurs and you're earning your spurs with them as you're like chatting. And it's super nerve wracking. Like that horror panel was crazy because you hadn't gone up first. None of us had gone up first. I was the first one on the plate or uh, in the in the sort of in the batting cage there, so to speak. And um, yeah, that was <laughs> so I'm like, I've got this whole weight on my shoulders of, Okay, I'm from GI Joe Berg. I'm I've got to set the tone here. Uh, don't be an asshole. Um, and yeah, it was great. I had there were some really, really, really cool people in that um, panel, in that uh, horror discussion panel. Uh, Melinda drove it really well. I felt um, Alex, who was the host, he also did the best job he could, and you know he he you know he managed. He made things happen. I also found out him and I have a lot in common with horror movies and stuff, which was great. Um, and you know. And then I found he is also an artist. He's like the artist on a GI Joe book at the moment. Hmm. Uh, so that's pretty amazing. Uh, amazing. So Alex, if you're listening to this, you're awesome. Um, Canadian, I assume. You're, yeah. I think so. I think he's from Canada. I just don't know if he is Canadian per se. But I'm not sure. Like I, I haven't really like you know like stalked. Him I mean, I'm basing this on very flimsy evidence. I just saw a bunch of like Canadian dollars being. Uh, handed over as super chats so i assume maybe that the channel was based in canada but actually that that doesn't mean anything i mean <laughs> someone sent a super chat of like 125 pesos the other day i was like whoa okay go nice. philippines yeah and I think then, it was um, filipino pesos how do you sell filipino pesos apart from like mexican jeez you, you don't <laughs> you, you don't, don't. I, I don't <laughs> same know. symbol hmm. and uh and and like literally the only person I really knew in that uh, panel like that I'd like watched videos from uh, is Simple Tricks and Nonsense because I think they have a great show um, and they definitely need more support. When I say more support, they definitely need more eyes on their channel. Um, you know, they produce... Oh, yeah, fantastic. I wanted to mention, I mean, maybe, yeah. maybe this is a good point to mention that like every time I was in attendance with, with, uh, with Michael French, it seemed like there was a very either... Expl well, it was, it was explicit because he actually said it, but maybe it was an implicit goal to Iconicon to spread focus a little bit, to yeah. expose smaller channels to a wider audience. So without fail, he always added some very kind words at the end of whatever stream he was mm -hmm. in. And, and anytime G.I. Joburg was involved, he, he tossed some our way saying like, it's fantastic. If you guys are into retro culture and, and love G.I. Joe, you know, if you're not a subscriber yet, hit that button immediately. So there was a definite drive and I, I appreciate it hugely. Um, you know, I, I never expect a kind of a windfall of numbers, but our subscriber base has swollen a little bit after this weekend, which yeah, totally can only mean one thing that Iconicon has served its purpose of like spreading the focus and it's not like people are doing this under duress like i've seen some comments from some from some new subscribers who've been like what how did i never see this before so it's yeah. not like it's not like gun to the head like like this stuff or or you're not cool it's more a case of like people you know we're reaching the audience that actually want to be here which is terrific um i, I always feel like there's a glass ceiling that like the subscriber numbers that you have today you can kind of add a trickle to uh over time as as more people come into the hobby but like you'll never like the the people who 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 would be interested in this stuff already are like you've kind of reached the your plateau as it were mm -hmm. 
but I guess I guess not. I guess new enthusiastic <laughs> fans who are like, "What? This is so my jam," are are finding their homes every day, which is cool. Well, like, which yeah, is, for sure. I mean, not not yeah. to put down all our, our longtime friends, but. <laughs> It's cool that, I mean, people that have not been able to find the channels that they're interested in or that they could possibly be interested in because the YouTube algorithm or whatever is not delivering to them the actual channels that they would love to be watching, finding it a chance to find those channels, um, you know, on top of all the great content that Iconicon has made, you know, the last couple of days. I yeah, think it was Order of Battle Pod... But forgive me if I'm wrong and it was actually anything Joe's or perhaps podcast from the pit. I do listen to you three in pretty tight rotation. So I might be mixing my podcast here. But and the reason I say it was probably Order of Battle was because it was um, perhaps Jason reporting back from a convention that he attended saying like he was talking to a bunch of Joe fans who are like hardcore collectors. And he was like, yeah, yeah. Did you see the the HTC review on this toy? And the guys were like, "Huh? Who? Oh, did you see Form BX two five sevens review?" And they're like, "What?" So <laughs> it is with some like irony that that people who are hugely invested in the, the the hobby, who've been collecting the toys forever, and who have massive collections to this day, um, still don't know the kind of I, I don't know the granddaddies of of GI Joe YouTube reviews um, because it just never occurred to them to look for YouTube reviews. I guess um, so. New people come into this. New people that would love this are coming into it all the time. I think mm -hmm. we can never um, take that for granted. Yeah, no, that's, there, that's, that's there's more people being born every day. <laughs> <laughs> but also well, like. Great chat. Uh, a great uh, point was raised by Andrew in the chat just now, saying that Melinda Mock of Retro Blasting only saw the flag floating in our Tomahawk review. Like that was the first time she saw it. So, yeah. and and she wasn't alone. There was another comment. Uh, wow, the comments exploded. Yeah, with all of that, they put a they, <laughs> they put a what in the what? They did a what okay. to a flag? Yeah, cheap shot. That was very deliberate on my part because I thought mm, as part of this online convention, there might be some new eyes. There might be some some, I suppose, subscriber drift from analog toys and retro blasting, watching our stuff for the first time. So let me see it with a bit of um, old footage, shall we say? Some hey, filler, shall sneaky, we say? Sneaky, well, sneaky. Well, at the same time, in my defense, I have but a handful of toys to, to put up on screen um, fresh uh, while I'm here in Oz. So I, I absolutely wanted to rely on some archival footage, shall we say? To kind of showcase yes this is a review in a very traditional sense but this is an indication of what it is we do uh, yeah. i suppose that brings us very squarely on to the next part of iconicon which was our 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 actually produced video and uh, not just a not just a live stream um but yeah our tomahawk review it was a long time in the in, in not not a long time in the making but uh, certainly it, it was a long time um, in consideration What's the term? It was a review many years in the making. Yes, uh, okay. Painted myself into a corner. In the, in the yeah. coming. Yeah, it didn't take me long to put together, but certainly it was something that I I've been meaning to do forever because this toy means that much to me. Mm. But um, I don't know, gents. Uh, you, you saw it, no doubt. I hope. Yes. No, <laughs> uh, what, totally what were your reactions? Oh, it looks go. really good. Paul's letting me go. See you yes. guys later. No, man, not Fire go up. away, you silly shit. <laughs> <laughs> You're fired. <laughs> Paul has let you go. You're fired. Um, <laughs> Sorry, <Ron. laughs> I, it's fantastic, dude. And it's kind of cool to kind of, I don't know why, but like the sand or wherever you film some of this looks different. <laughs> I don't know if that's because Australia has like different sand <laughs> to South Africa but um it's a f funny thing to say but um it's really awesome different I, I good different bad action. different what <laughs> it's just different it looks different to me like especially I think it was like midway where you kind of like panning around it maybe it's rock actually um but it, it looked different to me I don't know like desert sand like more orange no, it's, it's like rock and there's like a cool mm. light 
light on it. I can't remember exactly, but I don't know. It's just a stupid thing to say. But um, the the, the sand looked different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, but Townsville has a has a coarser sand. Uh, it's not like that mythical other beach called Whitehaven that uh, is like ninety nine point eight percent pure oh, silica. That'd be amazing to film on. Can you mention like? You know, just just brushing the toy off and like no sand coming home with you. <laughs> Imagine like just buffing the cockpit by, you know, just <laughs> swirling it around in the super fine sand. Uh, yeah, I mean, okay, I, I've told the story before on on GI Joe, but the the short version is like this: sand is so fine that it will not scratch glass or, or transparent plastic. It will actually buff it. It will actually smooth it out. Like people take their jewelry and kind of rub it in the sand. I took <laughs> I took a particularly scratched up uh, deep six action figure and I was just like rubbing his dome in the sand. <laughs> and it is a it is a national reserve and you are not allowed to take any of the sand with you. They will search your bags. They will hose your feet off as you reboard the ferry. That's wild. Yep. How even. They they use this pure silica for uh, NASA telescopes. So that's just don't let people on the beach then. Oh, something <laughs> I, I there was like a shot of an. Did you throw the tomahawk into the air? Because I remember there being like a, a, a shot with like the, the tomahawk in the air and the rotors going. Or was that an actual helicopter? So there is a RAAF base just up the road from me, and they are flying Chinook oh, helicopters. Okay. Because I was like, how did you get that shot? Mm. <laughs> I, I had several of those shots. I was trying so desperately to get a slow-mo shot of the Chinook's um, blades spinning. But uh, slow-mo on a camera phone really limits your zoom for some reason. I don't know. iPhone 8 let me down. Um, so I couldn't get what I wanted. But yes, that was an actual flyby from a real helicopter, probably. Okay, fantastic. I was, yeah. I was like, how did he do that? I've got a mate <laughs> who's, a, who's a Chinook pilot. And he has Damn. totally like given me a, a flaky offer, but in, which might be reneged at any point. But he said like I might be able to get you a visitor's pass for the base and let you have a go on the simulator. Ooh! Oh, cool. So that I fully cool. want to take one of those big old whirly bird buses and <laughs> plow it into the emergency department at the Townsville Hospital. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Kim. <laughs> No, they're definitely going to allow you to use it. Yeah, no, they're not going to do that. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 exactly. Practice, practicing some kind of suicide attack. That's a definite no-no. That will put me on some kind of watch list. Watch but list, overall, yeah. I really enjoyed the experience. I mean, it's, 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 it was really well put together. I like my voice in it, too. I thought that was, that was the best bits. <laughs> well, there was a comment or two hurled at the fact that, like, yes, it has returned to old, old G.I. Joburg form in that you know, the personas are back, like Rob, the kind of the technical professor type. Yes. Let me talk to you about the technical specifications of this helicopter. Uh, I think it was actually Cody, in fact, in the chat. He's like, yeah, that's, that's, that's Rob. All right. <laughs> no, I think uh, uh, there was actually quite a cool comment. And, uh, and Rob, if you'd like, uh, uh, if you're done, I just want to share some of my thoughts quickly as well. Yeah, no, go for it, dude. Sweet. So like one thing that was special about that, uh, I mean, the video is fantastic. Uh, and I had seen it about three or four times before we had put it up because we had been doing some QC on it, quality ch uh, control uh, on it, uh, Stephen and I. But um, And Rob, you were also part of that. I think you also, I mean, you got the links to check it out. But anyway, so like the video itself, I liked it. I thought it was great. But it was really cool to watch. And, it, and this is how it always feels when whenever we premiere a video uh, for me is that it always feels special because it feels like somewhere in that crowd, there's somebody that's seeing it that's like new to G.I. Joe Bird, you know? And that is actually made even better by the fact that we got like Berg Force in there, that we've got like G.I. Joe Berg supporters and, and fans and stuff in there as well. But in the Iconicon version, that definitely felt like a whole bunch of new eyes were seeing it, you know? And that was a special feeling. Like I actually knew the majority of the people there seeing it were like newbies. They're like guys who, you know, who are just new names, new people, people that I'd seen on panels from the horror panel and from the breakfast club panel, you know, some of their comment, uh, you know, chat box guys coming into there. And that was great. And it was cool to see guys like, 
you know, um, I saw Ryan Sweeney in there. I think Darren Cobb was in there as well. Uh, Cody was in there. Um, and also Chris Mewa of Chasing 80s. And I believe our very own uh, MCDJ, uh, ACDC was in there as well. Because uh, it was just flying by. And it was just so cool. Because like people were like, oh, my God. And, like with the flag. And then some of our guys would be like, yeah, they've done that. You must check it out. <laughs> and it was like, yeah, G.I. Really cool Joe Berg, old schoolers represent, man. The, the loyal mm. fans, schooling the newbies. Excellent. And it was cool. And and also, if I uh, left anybody out, I do apologize. It was 3 o'clock or half past 3 in the morning. So, <laughs> And I did have a, a big GI Joe debate after that. So my brain's a bit fried. But I just, I did see you guys. You guys were totally seen. And it was totally appreciated. And totally, just I just felt the love there as, as part of GI Joburg. Like, you know, that you guys, that the other parts of GI Joburg were coming together. And it's like you know, singing the praises of the video and, and really enjoying it as well. And that was cool. And also just on that note, to all of those guys as well that were in the panels, in the horror panels and in the Breakfast Club panels, you guys are rock stars. Thank you so much. It was so cool having you there, it, especially in the horror panel. I didn't feel quite so alone <laughs> um, because it was daunting. So I dug that video. I thought that video had like a real special kind of impact. And it was great that, that it was a tomahawk because the comments on that video have been fantastic as well. I had a tomahawk. I got one for Christmas. I played with mm. one to death. I took it to school like every day until eventually it was like a shell. <laughs> and, yeah, you know, that was cool. Like that kind of stuff is, is magical. And it, it's, it's great because we've all had like great experiences with this toy. So it was cool to get that feedback. I stand by my words. I, I, I still think it's perhaps my favorite toy of all time. It's just, it, that is, I mean, as much as any of the flesh and bone characters are like, the Tomahawk is a, a real American hero. That is so, so key to what G.I. Joe is. Mm. Uh, and it's so beautifully presented. Like something that I didn't include in the review proper because I think maybe getting a little bit too technical with the, the comic books would be, would go over a lot of people's heads, but you know, <laughs> maybe the reason it doesn't have doors is because of Snake Eyes's accident. Like, oh yeah, he was disfigured because Scarlet, her harness was jammed in the doors on a helicopter, and he freed her, but at the cost of getting a blast of aviation gas in his face. Um. So, so the for Tomahawk, evermore, they're like, no more doors ever. No more doors. Yeah, exactly. They rip the doors off the Tomahawk. They're like, hey, it's lighter this way. I mean, wear your like... seatbelts, guys. Don't fall. Yeah, it's, it's not like like this is an armored helicopter. Uh, it's not going to take it... too many hits. It's all about being quick and light and jam packed with power and weaponry. What did you What did you think of that comment? I think it was Ryan Sweeney. He did it. Um, yeah, shout out to it. Ryan. The guy's an absolute stalwart. Like I keep seeing him in streams in the chats throwing super chats at people like the guy has made iconicon like yeah right. he, he sure. is he, yeah exactly he's marathoning the whole show which is, is and gary v as see. well yeah. Uh, yeah also just worth mentioning sorry as these names come, are coming to me now gary v was also big uh, in there big time um but when i think it was ryan who said uh somebody was like in the chat box he just sort of went like we're like the top gear of gi joe reviews <laughs> <laughs> and Rob, you have what... been dubbed James May. You are Captain Slow. <laughs> no, Why am I'm Clarkson apparently. Why? I'm the other guy. Jeremy Clarkson. Oh. <laughs> you're the other guy. <laughs> you're uh, I'm the, you're the, the blonde one. Yeah, I'm that one. Richard Hammond. Man. Richard Hammond. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. But like, whatever, you know. That, like, but that was actually like so apt. I was like, wow, yeah, geez. Why? Because you're we... small. <laughs> <laughs> no man not, i'm talking about the whole um uh like that uh that statement in general man <laughs> never mind like who we are <laughs> although i gotta say that that is pretty right though i think our characters are all sort of in line with that although to be fair to be they fair rob put a Rob's, star Rob's in a is... reasonable vamp car no, whatever. No, <laughs> can it go for steven but like it's the stig Someone we never oh, see the face. Apparently, I'm of. also the stick. According to Chris Mio, I'm the stick. <laughs> All right. So, okay. I don't know. But uh, if we're done talking about the tomahawk, I mean, I could talk about it literally for the rest of my life. But uh, should we talk a little bit about this beauty? <gasps> and yes, I am talking about the thumbnail. <laughs> oh, oh my goodness! Holy 
crap, Paul. You've exceeded yourself, my friend. Thanks, dude. <laughs> I, I, I wish there was perhaps more opportunity to show off a thumbnail. Like, it literally is just the thing that you click on on YouTube, and it takes you to a thing. But this is some gorgeous stuff. Credits credits uh, for the Top Gear comparison actually go to Melinda of uh, Retro Blasting. Oh, uh, nice. Ryan just responded now in the in our chat. Yeah. How oh, cool is that? Hey, look, cool. it's an email from me. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I wanted to show you. Yeah. Like, okay, the photography is mine, the toy is Hasbro's, and the sun's sunrise is a work of the Gross. creator. But yeah. uh, that <laughs> logo, Paul, how the hell did you do that? Okay, so you know that um, in the photography that you sent me, you took a really tasty shot of that um, sticker. And uh, I was like, damn, what a cool icon for that helicopter. So I went and redrew it. I actually redrew it as a vector image um, because I thought, hey, cool, this is like worth doing. And, you know, maybe maybe people would want to have the G.I. Joe ver uh, Berg version of the Tomahawk Thug sticker. So I've done it as like high res anyway. But yeah, that's how is I did it. Clarity on, sorry, you've got my mind turning. What What is the Thug acronym? I... Uh, I actually thought you would know. <laughs> I know. It's you would. Like, no, look, I mean, it's... Yeah. It's pretty it's like... obviously some design element from the 80s. Yeah. Someone made it up and, and, and it's kind of lost in the midst of time. Maybe it stands in one of the, um, you know, the reference materials on the subject. Maybe Dan Klingensmith's book. Yeah. Uh, we should check it out. But it just, it's such an, an unusual thing because it's like that acronym and it's on the sticker. So I figured uh, I had to keep it there because I wanted to keep the sticker authentic. Although I did change a few things. There were a few design elements that I did change because uh, I didn't. What did you do? Um, for starters, the tomahawk actually goes all the way through to the bottom. So there's a, uh, like a little red um, square at the bottom underneath the, the writing, underneath the lettering, uh, which I took off because I felt that it's just, it's, a, it's an orphan. It doesn't belong there. It looks like a, a, like a mistake. And I also joined the wings together so that it creates that sort of V-shape so that the tomahawk is sitting in the wings. Um, and I joined the wings together because I don't like them being so like separate the, the way that they were originally. Um, and I did a slight color modification, like very subtle, just gave it a bit more of a, of a like a 3D shape, like on the feathers and on the tomahawk itself. Yeah, I just did that just to give it a bit more oomph because I mean, yeah, fine. It's like a sticker on a military vehicle and I did actually do a negative version of this where it's just the the silhouette. So you don't have any of that fancy shading, but I figured for the sticker version or for the the, the full color version, I'd uh, add that. And then if you guys look closely, I put a little bit of the white in there and that white is there because if you have a Tomahawk and you've got the sticker, you can see <laughs> that uh, with all GI Joe vehicles, colored stickers always a little bit off they they miss yeah. their white backing a little bit because that's what stops them from being transparent and i thought that would just add a nice touch to the proceedings hmm. so nice so just like enter the spider verse you deliberately cocked it up yeah <laughs> no i'm kidding it it adds authenticity it, it gives it a kind of a i wouldn't say three-dimensionality it's there's a toyeticness to having the color print and the white print slightly offset like that it's yeah, it's just, very it's, it's very authentic. Yeah, so that's what I was trying to go for. And you know, <laughs> I, I had to actually this... correct Melinda at one point because she had listed the review as the Tomahawk Thug review. So she was kind of clearly going off of what the thumbnail said and not what the description said, uh, which is understandable. Of course, the thumbnail is the more dominant uh, yeah, it's vocal. I yeah. idea, I guess. Um, but yeah, very sheepishly, I sort of corrected her saying like, I have no idea what that acronym means. So I can't really call it the Tomahawk Thug review because it's, what, it's a Tomahawk Aww. Thug. <laughs> but um, yeah, <laughs> it's there. Nice. And also, um, I believe uh, it was MCDJ ACDC that actually asked uh, while the Tomahawk video was going. And I, th this is what happens to my brain. I'm getting flashes now. Uh, I think he asked, "What counter is that?" Um, that's my that's my desk. <laughs> that's that's my desk. No, no, no. Uh, Hang on, Paul. I think yeah. he's referring to the counter uh, in the. Sh I have a single shot of a very bent tomahawk rotor blade. Oh, 
So uh, that's, that okay, rudder so play comes play. from from MCDJ ACDC's hands. Hey. Yeah, so, okay. so there, there are many layers at play in a GI Joe book review. That was the only counter I could think of. <laughs> but but it's a valid valid guess. Anyways, there are many layers to this image, gentlemen. It is the thumbnail that Paul whipped up for the great GI Joe comics debate. And I always have more to say about the thumbnail than I have to say about the debate because if you want to check <laughs> out the debate, it's uh, it's on GI Joe Book's channel. It'll be listed as a video. It's kind of fallen out of the sort of the live portion and is now fully part of our catalog. So if you want 90 minutes of people nerding out about G.I. Joe comics and trying to definitively say that the second 50 issues of Marvel are better than the first, or trying to at least, <laughs> <laughs> then uh, click on that video and see some talking heads. But Psycho what killer. makes this thumbnail so cool for me is not just the Cobra Commander image from issue 100 of him with the microphone standing. Well, he's standing in Millville, but you cut him out quite uh, cleanly and used him as the top layer. Or, well, the second layer? I don't know. You've got text yeah, over I use him. him I use him as the focal point, yeah. Either way. <laughs> kind of yeah. in, in a, a faded um, layer behind that. The background is made up of a collage of images. But the images on the left of frame are all images taken from issues 1 to 50 of key moments and characters. And the, the images on the right of frame are the same for issues 51 to 101. So you've got character introductions on the left-hand side and the uh, hints of Quinn and the, the October God and the Battle of Springfield, Destro, the reveal of the Arashikage tattoo on Storm Shadow's wrist from issue 21. And then on the right, you've got the Cobra Island Civil War, uh, Serpentor being dispatched by his arrow, the Snake Eyes trilogy's kind of climax of uh, Storm Shadow holding onto Snake Eyes, holding onto Baroness as they teeter off the edge of the crumbling Cobra Consulate building. Um, what else can I see? There's a lot going on there, guys. You should do yourself do yourself a favor and find the thumbnail. It's probably on Instagram or Facebook, but uh, it's worth passing an eye over. So, Paul, I just like to give credit where credit's due. I don't think there's Thank a competition you. for best thumbnail uh, from Iconicon, but this is sh certainly you definitely win it. <laughs> well, a strong contender. I'd say Two Cents Toys has got a great dio shot um, for their panel on why, like the psych psychology of collecting toys. It's got like a stormtrooper uh, on a kind of a, a therapist's couch. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's, I don't know I why mean, I keep missing, man. Dude. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Diagnose that. I hate being Anyways. a plot device. Yeah. Oh. And that's all I have Thanks, to say man. about that. And uh, uh, Ryan, yeah, Ryan clears up a little bit more what Melinda meant by us being Top Gears is about our voiceover work. Ooh. And oh, really? it kind of how our reviews feel. So I suppose it's kind of like how we review the toys is how they review cars or, or whatever they review on Top Gear. <laughs> and Ryan so thinks we're the stars of, of Iconicon. That's pretty cool. <laughs> effective, oh, thank you, Ryan. Um, effectively, we are just the Top Gear guys because of our exotic accents. I think that's, that's what it is as well, you know, essentially. Thanks, Melinda. And um, also, Ryan's never seen such flat rotors before. Stephen, how did you do that? Um, how? Well, that's my trick. You know, this tomahawk came to me um, as it, it had its rotors stripped out. So it was just two hubs, which is pretty much the only sane way to transport a tomahawk. And once you have the rotors all detached and, and lying in front of you, you can kind of rank them. And put the the kind of the best the pick of the litter on one hub, and then the ones that have a serious sag to them, <laughs> the ones that have yeah the ones in need of a little blue pill perhaps, um, you can flip them and put them on the other hub. So I mean there was a point that I ma made at one point in the video that like real world um, <laughs> twin rotor hub helicopters or tan yeah. Yeah, the helicopters of this configuration, like the Chinook, um, the blades don't spin the same direction. So the way the Tomahawk is kind of factory made uh, doesn't make sense. Like one hub needs to be flipped 
so that the blades spin in a different direction. So you can use your more bowed uh, rotors on that hub and let gravity do the work for you. But if they really need some straightening out, I found like playing a hairdryer over it for like literally a minute mm -hmm. while you are kind of working it. Like you have to do these things in concert. So you almost need three hands. Um, you have to be bending it while it's getting direct heat. You know what worked for uh, me? That'll <laughs> sort it out. Yeah, we'll work for you. What worked for me on my Eagle Hawk, and I'm specifically mentioning the Eagle Hawk because I don't know if the plastic is the same. Oh, it's but, far thinner. Uh, yeah, so what I did with that is I just put it in a... Or far oh, less brittle. The, it's got more bend, more flexion got, yeah, to it than the, the old school. Yeah. So what I did with those is I took your advice when I just took them out and then turned them upside down, you know, so that they were, it looked like, it looked like it had stuck its fingers in the plug because its rotors were up in the air. <laughs> um, Which is a valid look. I mean, if you see stills of helicopters, oftentimes the blades are flexing upwards, you know, depending on what kind of maneuvers it's pulling, there are forces working on those blades all the time. So... Yeah. It is valid for the the rotors to sometimes have a bend upwards. Exactly, and if you're in a hurry to do it, what I found helped is if you got a really nice, uh, like thick, hardcover kind of uh, coffee table book, and if uh, in fact if you have two, that's even better, and you got a nice sunny spot in your home, um, then yeah, you put all of the the rotors in there, and then you just you sandwich the rotors uh, with obviously within reason. Don't uh, you can't um sandwich that like sort of there's like a little bit of a notch that kind of makes it a, a mess that connects to the rotor i mean to the rotor hub so just like slot them in there pop the the heavy books uh sandwich them between those two heavy books leave it out in the sun and that actually fixes it up fixes it up in about an hour or less that's also helped for me in the past but I, then again I'm I'm skeptical of that. I, I need more aggressive strategies than leaving it in the sun I yeah. find it, in my limited experience, like the kind of more passive methods are disappointing. Like you need active bending of the thing. You need to you realign those. Yeah. See, I've broken yeah. too much stuff in my life Molecule. like that. That's why. Uh, that, okay. Yeah. Paul is See, the Zen well, master. Well, so now yeah. that you guys, so now our, our listeners slash viewers have two different approaches. They've got the <laughs> slow, subtle, let the sun do the work approach. And then they've got Steven's, Steven's approach. <laughs> and then I just said a hair dryer. I didn't say like a heat gun. I had yeah, no, short that... of, actually, of things that will actually melt plastic. But yeah, yeah no, if there's... you want to really take a chance, yeah, applying focused heat to plastic will <laughs> definitely change it forever. Um, yeah, yeah. Careful with that. <laughs> I would, I would, I would yeah. use it. Extreme caution, please. Yeah. So you're saying overall the experience in the discussion of the current books was, was quite positive. I think it took a little while for us to get past the awkwardness of like who goes first. Ah. So uh, I was in two minds about the whole thing because on the one hand, there's there's the there's the debater in me which wants to prepare an argument and and, and formalize everything. And then there's the more mature understanding part of me, which is like this doesn't have to be adversarial and it shouldn't be. It should be a few like diehard fans really enjoying talking about some comic books. Um, yeah. And, and that kind of was the dominant idea. Also, like I've been able to reflect on this stuff almost wholly. Like the Tomahawk review was done. It was in the can. It was uploaded. It was ready for Iconic Con. I could sit back and read comic books for a week and focus on like what I wanted to say. Whereas Effectively, the other members of the debate were all heavily, heavily involved in Iconicon. It was Michael French, Matt Swafford, who I realize is very involved in retroblasting. He's actually living there at the moment <laughs> over this weekend because he's on he's he's, he's pitching in on so much content. And uh, Analog Toys, Tony Robert. So literally, these are the three individuals. I mean, all it needed was Melinda in the mix, and then we would have had kind of the most hardworking people of the entire event. So uh. there's no ways they would have been able to focus. Like they've got a focus that's split 50 different ways. So I didn't want to come on too strong. Um, that said, like 
the structure that I did think would fly would have been a case of, you know, as is the classic case with any courtroom drama or, or formal debate, it's a case of the alleger must prove. So the proposal, the team saying 51 to 101 are superior issues. The guys with a bigger burden of proof or bigger onus, they needed to kind of set the parameters and start the debate. And Tony and myself would then be needed to refute that. Mm. Um, it sounds like but, you gave up a lot of thought to this and getting reading comic books for a week to get ready for a talk. That's amazing. Yeah, it and might guys, have been a little longer than a week. Yeah. <laughs> and also, guys, it's, it's... 101 issues of G.I. Joe, man, and I didn't want to skimp and like just like skim things. I read the letters pages, guys, and what an incredible voyage of discovery that was. Like the reaction to Cobra Commander getting killed and the editor, who obviously was misinformed and couldn't read Larry Harmer's mind or tell the future, didn't know that he was going to come back from the dead. So the editor was on her or his best God trying to like put people down and say like, yes, I'm afraid definitively Cobra Commander is dead and he's not coming back. And no matter how many letters you write pleading <laughs> with us to bring him back, he's dead. Oh no. Of course, Larry turned it all around, but you know, I have huge sympathy for him because we're seeing these events from the top down. Like we can crush 10 years worth of comic books uh, reading in, into like a couple of sessions, you know, a, a week's worth of work or <laughs> play, I should say, pleasure. Um, but for him, this was like, you know, a number of years had passed and it's like, well, clearly the, the, the fan fervor for Cobra Commander isn't going to go away. Let's pull a J.R. Ewing on everyone and say he survived that rather brutal um, magnum shot to the heart. Yeah. Yeah, oh, he had yeah. a second one. And also, guys, <laughs> he's uh, heartless. Actually... He's a snake. <laughs> and that also brings up like Called a very Ewing's important uh, that, yeah. that brings up like a very important like thing that's worth mentioning with Iconicon. Preparation. I mean, Steve, you spent like, you know, time reading. I mean, you shot the Tomahawk stuff and, you know, we all did voices and whatever. But then there was everything we did for our individual panels. I mean, you read a whole bunch of G.I. Joe comics. Uh, Rob, what did you do? To prep for yours like well so, so once i knew that you know we, what we we're going to be doing which was Arnie and stone from the 80s <clears throat> i made like a big list of all of the movies all 23 of them well they actually technically there's 24 there's one called the comeback but it's actually a documentary not a, not a movie and that i couldn't find anywhere <laughs> um but otherwise yeah so i i got my hands on all those films one way or another and and i watched all of them over the over the over the course of uh, i think probably a month or so i mean i kind of no. pushed it near the end i kind of like started going like ah oh, i need to watch more um so and Arnie's yeah, still it, your boy after all i that? well i think i think it's it's more nuanced than saying like arnold schwarzenegger is my favorite because i think they have their own strengths in the the types of movies that they do um but i think arnold still is my absolute favorite but stallone definitely has a lot more positives than i, I think i ever gave him um, like something I didn't know. I mean, I knew he wrote and directed most of the, the, you know, the Rocky movies. I mean, he wrote all of them, I believe, and he directed most of the later ones, but other than, I think it's th th four movies in the eighties, he wrote every single, or he worked on the screenplay for every other movie that he did in the eighties. Wow. Like he had some input in the creative process of, you know, coming up with the story or at least, you know, later on kind of like finishing the story, like as, as I suppose he got more involved in the movies. Um, so other than like directing a whole bunch of them, he wrote basically every single movie, or at least he was involved in the development of the, the stories. And that's crazy. Um, well, I he think... does have a very shiny gold headed man in his collection. And I'm not talking about Steel Brigade or Destro version two. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Stallone, Stallone has critical acclaim and has been recognized by the Academy. And yes, I mean, like he, he just, he kind of, he kind of, he knows where his strengths are. And I think he plays towards them, you know, in his, in his writing, um, like even a movie like over the top, which is, you know, a film about a, an estranged father, um, you're trying to get, trying to know, or at least get to 
get to know his his son um, while also being a trucker and taking part in a arm wrestling competition. <laughs> there are still very like poignant moments in that movie where you kind of like see his he's he's a villain, but he's also a hero. Um, he's he's a human, um, mm. and I think Stallone is very good at writing humanizing characters. Um, oh, yeah. He's, it wasn't within the, the scope of your discussion because it was outside the 80s, but uh, damn it, did I discover Copland too late? Or maybe I discovered oh, it at the right time. And it, was, and it was panned by critics, eh? Well, what do they know? Yeah, I think that is exactly. quintessential Stallone. He's playing the everyman. He's not the sharpest, but he's persistent and he's a good man. And ah, oh, jeez, it's so good. And mm. like, I get hairs on the back of my neck every time I think about the meltdown in first blood like, mm, at the end it's, it's, it's crazy you know i it's came back to that movie as, as most of us kind of younger audience members did like knowing the rambo persona as the guy with the explosive tipped arrows you know <laughs> cutting people apart with an enormous like a, a use machetes knife. and like blowing them apart with you know 50 cal mm -hmm. oh, and then God. to watch first blood and see like a pretty honest depiction of like, well, I mean, before they even had an acronym for for post traumatic stress disorder, a very very truthful display and performance by, you know, one of the kind of the the hair and muscles, <laughs> the the oily boys from the eighties. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I like what Melinda had to say in that panel, Rob. Um, she said something about like how his character had essentially gone from being a rock star. Was it Melinda that was saying it? But yeah, it was. It's gone yeah. from being a rock star to then, you know, not even being able to get a job like, you know, cleaning cars or parking cars or whatever. And that is so poignant. Like that that is the one thing that separates First Blood from, you know, from its sequels because it's a completely different Rambo movie. It's it's a completely different Rambo and it's it's got a real, real message. Like I'm not saying the others don't, but like this one really does. It really hits home and and guys like um, and I, I don't want to touch too, like, you know, on a, too much of a personal level, but like, if you have served in any capacity, even if you've uh, served as like a, a lawman, as a, as a, as a police officer or something like that, and, you know, having lived with one, you know, my whole life. Well, especially uh, speaking about law enforcement, geez, Paul, <laughs> the, the, yeah. the battlefield is, is, is on the home front for those guys. So mad no, props true. to your dad. You know, and the thing is like, you know, you're also dealing with that kind of guy at home. You know, and he's also like you, uh, in in our culture and in South Africa, we also had no such thing as PTSD or anything like that. You know, it was just like drink a dog uh, and suck it up kind of thing. You know, mm. and uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and that's what makes Rambo so relatable. And it's also something I only really understood and appreciated it, uh, as a as a I'd say as a teenager when I watched First Blood properly. So, you guys, it's such a great panel on that, Rob. Sorry, I just mm, had yeah. to say you. You, you invoke so many cool like memories and thinking and, and the discussions you guys got into were fantastic. Like, but yeah, flicking to overall, Arnie amazing. and like, I think I speak for you as well, Rob, when I say that his vehicles are us, so, they speak to us so much. Like as good as all of Stallone's entries might have been and the, the kind of dramatic heights that he sailed to, they don't push the same buttons for like sci-fi action fans that... On his Arnie films, did. did like it yeah, doesn't matter yeah. about his performances. He was just a, a presence, and he was the right presence to a play the Terminator, Terminator, which is ironically a film that also has its fair share of PD PTSD issues. But of course, Arnold's not doing the heavy lifting there. It's all in the hands of Michael Bean. Um, and then the other guilty pleasure sci-fi movie, which is Predator. These mm. are just fantastic seminal action flicks. That had like big guns, big muscles, oily skin, <laughs> big bad, like down. a big bad. Down to again. Fight, you know, this unassailable, like evil thing trying to hunt you that you can just unload an entire arsenal into and and it and it keeps coming. Like that's just the fun of those. Like oftentimes when you've got flesh and blood enemies enemies, it devalues the the kind of the carnage that you're unleashing on them but mm. literally like there was a minigun in 
uh, in Predator. Predator. Like, when that yeah. thing cut loose, every little boy and girl, perhaps, like everyone, <laughs> lost their minds. Um, so, yes, just That's cinematically, crazy. those things are hard to beat. They just have, hi- yeah, yes. No, no, I was just going to say, Rob, uh, sorry, just one of the highlights for me was when you compared, when you mentioned that Terminator in a lot of ways is kind of a horror movie. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, I think I've heard that somewhere else, but like if you think about it, it really is a, it is a oh, horror no, movie. Oh, no, I've. I've given it serious thought. I, I actually didn't bring it up in the horror panel on purpose because I didn't mm. want to, uh, because I was, I had a feeling you might bring it up or you might talk about the horror of the first Terminator. But um, what I think, I mean, the difference in Arnold's watching and Stallone is like Stallone, I think is cons- consistently, I wouldn't say consistently good, but I mean, he's consistent. Like when yeah. you enter a Stallone movie, most of the time, you're always going to get, you're getting Stallone and a, a a good dramatic performance i think even in movies like rhinestone where it's it's kind of you know it's it's dolly parton it's it's ridiculous um you know kind of like country western stuff but he's still doing a really good performance in there while with arnold schwarzenegger i think it's more his the choices he makes and the the choices the producers think he will be good in where he's got a lot of highs but he also has a lot of really low lows yeah. Like not every single one is is an absolute hit, but when it does hit, it hits way better. I think way harder than Stallone's movies in general, at least for me. Um, no, I can see that. Like definitely, Predator, yeah. Running Man, Twins is way funnier than like Rhinestone. Um, Twins is any day cool. of the week. Um, mm. Obviously, Commando. I mean, it's just over the top, crazy, <laughs> awesome, the best. <laughs> Um, Conan for, for, for fantasy fans. I mean, I, as I think Andre from Midnight's Edge was mentioning in, in the panel, they had to craft that role around Arnold once they knew that he was the star because, because it's so early speak. in his career, he can't no. speak English that good yet. Even, I mean, even later on, he can't really speak English that good, but <laughs> <laughs> they crafted the entire movie. They changed it completely to be able to fit him and it fits him so well because I have, I, I've got to be honest, I haven't read many Howard, uh, Robert E. Howard books or read any other comic books of Conan. But for me, Arnie is Conan. And I think that's mm. what happens is he creates these iconic roles. Um, mm. And you just can't see anyone else playing that character. It's interesting like that you mentioned that um, as well. Like, like I, I know that in the panel when, when Conan was brought up and you, know, you can hear half of the panel kind of going, oh, Conan, you know. And the reason it elicits that response is because, like exactly like you said, now you your impression of Conan is Arnold, is Arnie, right? Mm. And but if you've read the books and stuff, you actually know he's quite a talker, and he, you know when he does talk, he what he's you know he actually lets out quite a lot of sense. He's a very he's kind of he's quite a wise character in a lot of ways. Like Conan is great. I mean, he becomes king. <laughs> you know, he's you know, and it's it's interesting because like the movie version of Conan is kind of like, it's also kind of accurate to the comic books, just to all the parts where he's not talking. You know? Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of, it's, it's more of a sense of, of who he is. You, you, yeah. you understand that he is exceptionally intelligent. Um, and I, I think, um, and you can kind of see where, I mean, the, I think both movies end with, um, well, I don't think I know. They both end with him kind of sitting on the throne and this like later version of Conan who's eventually become king. And you can totally buy that he kind of gets to that point in his life where he is now a king. Yeah, I think he, he owns that role, in, you know, cinematically. And I don't think any <laughs> other version since then has really come close to that. So, Rob, Barbarian or Destroyer? <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I'm sorry, Bobby. <laughs> Bobby Vella. But it's, it's Barbarian all the way. I mean, Destroyer is interesting to a certain degree. Um, but it just doesn't feel as, like, visceral, I think, as, like, Conan the Barbarian. Barbarian and, and personal as well. I mean, the whole movie is him trying to kind of like, you know, become his, you know, kind of do his own thing, but also kind of come back to, you know, re- enacting revenge against the, the man that killed his family. Mm. Um, and yeah, it's way stronger. And then also, I mean, he, he has a, his girlfriend, the love, at least at the time that was his life, he loses her and he hopes to get her back. Um, but obviously, he can't. Um, yeah, Grace I think it, it's, it's way stronger. Oh. oh gosh, yeah. I mean, she's definitely a highlight of 
<laughs> She's incredible. Oh, destroy Sorry, it. I'm always going to be a big fan. Uh, so, you know, regardless of the quality of the filmmaking, she's just fun to watch. No, I mean, and the, the music cool is terrific well, as well. About the, the, these early movies, that they're so physical. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, in the performances and the world that they live in feels real because it's all physically there. Even when they are doing, uh, you know, like matting and other kind of um, special effects. The majority of it is there and they actually are they're riding through these villages that they either built or they found somewhere um, you know, you know, they are clashing the for real yes mm. i mean it's 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 incredible and then you look at today where you know you, you know the actors are maybe not even riding on actual horses they're sitting on little green boxes in a green stage <laughs> and they just add it all in, in afterwards it's like wow those computer nerds are really good at creating amazing worlds. I really appreciate the art of this, but it doesn't sell, you know, the performance or the the, the stories of the film, as well as some some movies from the eighties and and the nineties, I suppose. Um, are you having a go at Peter Jackson, by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> I want that Hobbit, fellowship yeah. put through absolute hell. <laughs> 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 I think we've skipped over something, James, and it is a titanic battle of wits between Mr. Michael French and Mr. Paul Lopesher about the merits of the Breakfast Club. Uh, yes, yeah. tell us about this, Paul. <laughs> okay, so how did you beat from... him? <laughs> <laughs> okay, aside from like watching a lot of horror movies leading up to the horror panel, because believe it or not, that actually caused like. And uh, uh, Steve, I don't know, did you feel this as well with the G.I. Joe thing? It's like, you know G.I. Joe, right? But you still want to read it and make sure... I mean, that's why you did, right? But I mean, you still go and do all of your research because a part of you is like, maybe I don't know it as well as I think I do, you know? And so I had that with the horror, right? And so I did the horror panel. panel and this is building up to the Michael French, uh, Paul Breakfast Club debate. Um, I had this like horror panel coming up and it was scaring the hell out of me. And uh, I watched all of these horror movies to prepare myself because even though they wouldn't speak about all these movies or we wouldn't, you know, get to all of them, you want to get the milieu. You want to get the 80s, you know, like you want to find like the flavor of it. And so that part that had ended. And afterwards, I was like, oh, shit, there's so many things I could have said. Oh, my God. And I was like watching mm -hmm. Reback. I was like, uh, watching back. I was like, oh, why did I say that? <laughs> oh, why, why did I forget? Let this it go, thing? Paul. Could... You got to let it go, man. No, right. That's the thing. You got to let it go. <laughs> but anyway, so that was weighing on me a little bit. So I was like, no, I've got to make sure that my breakfast club game is tight. <laughs> so I just went in. Um, I just thought about like I watched the Bre breakfast club and stuff again. And I watched it with a very critical eye, um, almost as if I was trying to devalue the film. And uh, I picked a lot of stuff from it. Um, but it was cool because uh, as I was watching it, I was remembering a lot of stuff that I watched uh, that I got from it when I watched it originally. Technically, my second time. Um, and yeah, and then when we started off, Michael was just so friendly and so kind, and just the way that he just brought, uh, came into the whole thing. I was like, oh wow, this is going to be a cool chat about the Breakfast Club. Because at one point, I was like, is this still a, a debate or are we just talking? And I'm like, we're yeah. just talking. Let's just go with it. You know, it's very disarming because. When you're watching his videos and he's got a point that he wants to make quite strongly, it is very strongly made. Mm. So you're expecting any kind of debate when you're on opposite sides of a, of a divide to be very adversarial. Yeah. But actually, he almost doesn't want to win. Like, mm. I mean, he says as much. He, he doesn't want to, 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 to win the contest. It's like, no, that's... I I I I will say my piece, but I really don't want to win this. Uh, I don't need that kind of pressure. Um, and so it does devolve into a, a fun chat. So like, yeah, absolutely. I was expecting yeah. to be all guns blazing, and I was quickly kind of brought back from the brink by the kind of chat that it, it became. But and anyways, cool. tell your story, Paulie. And yeah, so that was the thing, and it was just like you know he touched on some points, and and it's interesting, like a film like The Breakfast Club. Um, I, I'm sure it does have, you know, it does split opinions and split hairs and whatever's amongst people. But it's funny how like a lot of the stuff that he was talking about is very similar to how I feel about the film, but it's just a matter of perspective and like how you see it. And that's where I was coming from with, with my argument as much as possible, <laughs> as much as I can remember now. Um, <laughs> I, I can remember one point that I, I did want to bring up. And I'm sure you'll recall that Mike's 
argument as to why the breakfast club should be dropped from public consciousness and forgotten is that it is extremely subversive and the message mm. is kind of a kick in the teeth and it's it's a very hollow message that in spite of the kind of connections that these kids form that one fateful day that come monday all the good work in kind of building bridges between their social cliques will be undone and forgotten and everything will return to the status quo like it's a very deflating message to send and he mm. said like that is why like that is why this movie is trash <laughs> okay i'm yeah. putting words in his mouth but that, but effectively that that was the kind of the hinging point on his of his argument and and you didn't disagree paul in fact i think you guys agreed on most things but yes. i would i would then say that mike's point is actually a reason why this film is so memorable and should be right. retained that it's in the bubblegum yeah. disney's mm. high school musical world of like high school flicks that paint this picture of like inclusivity and that the jocks and the brainiacs and the skaters and the wastoids and like the the karate kids and the nerds you know they can all just come together and and be in the high school musical or whatever the the thing that they're trying to band together to do is is this pie in the sky no notion and it doesn't reflect on the real world and the real world mm -hmm. is harsh and these these lessons are quickly eroded and forgotten um so breakfast club stands like it's a hell of a cynical message from a hell yeah. of a cynical bit of filmmaker who's quite asinine about it but it's nevertheless painfully honest and very true to to what happens in in real school situations so yeah, a, i'd say I, that's that's why it's like culturally very important yeah exactly and like a that, that was also what I was trying to get at was, and I mean, he actually gave me such a great metaphor. It's like when, you know, the film is like, oh, well, what he's, he, what he was saying was like, what I'm saying is like, you're holding, it, it holds a mirror up to you as an audience. And I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, actually that is the best metaphor. Somebody like myself who loves a good metaphor. Uh, I didn't even think about it that way, but yeah, it does actually, or well, it doesn't press upon you that, yeah, you, you're just like these kids in a lot of ways. And you, as a, as a, you get to, take these lessons and you get to do something with these lessons even though that said it, don't yeah. you think the breakfast club is hugely overrated it's a um, seminal period like film of the 80s that everyone kind of references i watched it for the first time like its reputation is not deserved this, so, is, this is just a slice of life piece of filmmaking like damn. i don't get it clearly so i'm not <laughs> part of that gen x crowd so here's the irony okay with that film it's actually not that uh yes it's it's um it's a seminal piece of 80s filmmaking and it's and it's gone into like everything else it's gone into there's elements of the breakfast club in pretty much any uh film or tv series teen where flick. there's any teen flick anytime you put smash kids together um in fact i wouldn't be surprised if some of those treatments actually read we're going for a bit of a breakfast club meets vampires feel you know buffy <laughs> um <laughs> but like uh, you know, it's that, but you know, it's actually not that highly, like, it's, it's highly regarded in a lot of ways, but it's not highly reviewed. It's got a, it just, it's got a mostly an above average review in most places. And when it came out, I think it got an MTV award, but it didn't get any other big awards. It's, it's interesting like that. Like, in uh, that look, respect. I don't think you can have cult status and critical acclaim. I think exactly. sometimes those are, those are exclusive. And like also like cult films are are the weekly reviewed like gritty gory trashy movies but we just can't help but love them love them exactly and sometimes yeah. sometimes those films are actually masterpieces um mm. you know like in the uh, event horizon <laughs> um <laughs> you like that <laughs> dude event horizon i don't know if it's brilliant. aged well has it it's aged very well which it the other day it's like it's 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 still got the hokiness of the 90s in it but it's it's aged pretty well like it's still fucking scary. It's like it's cool for that. It's age. It's certainly aged better than um than one of its contemporaries, which is Alien Resurrection. Alien Resurrection, I used to love, and now I'm like eh, about it nowadays. Whereas Event Horizon has only gotten stronger in my eyes. But anyway, but like I don't want to shift gears from that too much. What I did want to mention is that, um, in that debate, I actually sort of I mentioned some kind of wonderful, and I personally feel that some kind of wonderful does a much better uh does a much better job of uh, of sort of breaking the click 
status um, and breaking a lot of the sort of teenage uh, expectations and teenage sort of stereotypes um, better than the Breakfast Club does. It's just that it's a form that doesn't that doesn't uh, get labeled as the form that does that, you know. Uh, because the long story short, it's about a character who's in love with this other chick. He's really into her um, and sort of starts selling himself out to kind of be with that girl. And then his best friend who has been there the whole time. It's basically like she's all that or whatever. It's just reverse. It's, it's a girl instead of it's a girl that can't be seen instead of a guy. It's kind of the inverse of 16 Candles. But what she says to him um, is actually really powerful. And in some ways, like it's more powerful than what Breakfast Club does. But we were talking about the Breakfast Club, so I didn't want to take st stray too far from that. And yeah, I <clears throat> I don't want to go. Into I think you put it yourself very nicely, Paul. And the Thank votes you. were absolutely hung. Like there were, I think, twenty eight votes on. There, there were fifty six votes in it, and it was an even split, twenty eight and twenty eight. Unbelievable. That was pretty cool. Uh, guys, just from the uh, comments quickly, Gaz, I love you, dude. <laughs> I think it holds up, but not like Breakin, Two Electric Boogaloo. That film is epic. <laughs> <laughs> wiki, wiki, yeah. wiki, indeed. Guys, before we put a, a pin in this episode, we'd be remiss if we didn't reference perhaps the coolest high point and the brightest spot on what has been a magnificent event. So, Props to the organizers, but in a panel between Bobby Valor, Two Cents Toys, and Tony from Analog Toys, Bobby revealed that the upcoming Action Force exclusive figure for Wave 2 is none other than Desert a Rat. version Desert Rat, yes, which is a nod to the first wave of Pally Toy Action Force figures. But it is done in the likeness of Tony from Analog Toys. Tony that is getting his crazy. own his own action figure, which I mean, I right after this podcast concludes, I urge everyone to track down that live stream, and I'll give you the time code. One hour fifteen minutes into it, Bobby gets hold of the mic and sh shares his screen. And uh, and unveils this for a very very appreciative, dumbstruck Tony. Um, Absolutely emotional. I mean, I think he he was like, I'm so glad that you're showing this figure on the screen right now, so people can't see me crying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is a beautiful moment, and captured forever. Uh, the link will be in the description below to wherever you're listening or watching this. Um, just skip to one hour fifteen and enjoy that moment with us. Uh, and then go back and watch the whole it, thing. Um, um, but a, a very excited Tony messaged me um, shortly after that and said, like, did you watch the stream? And I was like, no, what happened? Skipped to an hour 15. And I immediately shot back. I was like, <laughs> dude, that is incredible. Well done. And Bobby is the man. I mean, if we didn't already an know. It's an incredible likeness. Um, it, it looks absolutely amazing. And like the response from not just Tony, um, but from everyone like who was live at this thing was like, we want three, we want four. Will you sign it for us? <laughs> um, and Bobby's like, We're gonna come to Australia and get it signed, you know, get so personally. And yeah, it was, I'm it was totally an amazing moment. What a what Tony, a hype. Tony was an SAS operator, uh, and he, he did a tour in Iraq actually, um, mm. with some distinction. I mean, at one point, I think there was uh, reports of gunfire, and and Tony was uh, on sort of um, he, he was security for a, an Iraqi general and he, he rushed this general to, to safety, kind of grabbed him and, and pulled him along and the, the general honored him with, I think, a uh, battle ribbon or something. Uh, look, I don't know enough Come about... Come on, um, get to the chopper. <laughs> basically, <laughs> yeah. to the chopper. Come on. Tony's a get real to hero and, and uh, <laughs> is being honored in perhaps the, 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 the best way any kind of toy fan could possibly be. Um, and yes, he, like... Action Man was his inspiration for joining the armed forces, and it's come full circle, as Tony said in the in the stream. So do check it out and and enjoy the moment as as a fan of toys and just a community that is wonderful and keeps giving giving back to itself, which is and yeah, which, yeah. Which you know what? 
Hasbro could learn from. Anyway, just have <laughs> oh, to. Yeah. Are, you, are you potentially butthurt about the, um, the the restock on Baroness and? No, uh, I am not. I, I, and I'm so glad you brought it up because I totally want to touch on that. After I just touch on this one little tidbit of awesomeness, Ooh, not only is Tony, not only is Tony from Analog Toys face sculpt beautifully rendered uh, in action figure form, but one of the coolest things that they had that they had done for that toy is his gun. He's got a custom, uh, M, uh, what is it, M340? M4. Oh, M4. Dude, it is so cool. It's not just a little gun. Like, <laughs> you're going to get that toy, and you're going to have Tony's personal custom M4 that he used uh, when he was on tour. That is freaking amazing. When I saw that, the hairs on my back went up. I was like, well, the Ooh. three hairs on my back went up. I was like, dude, that's so <laughs> freaking right. I switch out, the mate. three you can't reach with the shave. Amazing. Yeah, well, <laughs> the three I can't reach. But... Uh, and uh, to My Ryan, I say yes. Was set on it. <laughs> Ryan, Ryan has just asked me if I would like a Baroness. And to you, good sir, I say yes. And yes again, please. Please, oh, please. It's on record now, Let's Ryan. Do. Just <laughs> the love of, of the world. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, man. If you can, I would be so grateful. Just let me know. But then also just a little thing, uh, just coming back to the, the sort of re-releases. I am so happy that they've done it. I'm so happy because I saw that and I was like, oh, wow, this is actually really great. Like, it's Hasbro. Like, you know, as much as I, I, I always say this, as much as I might kick Hasbro in the nuts or in the shins every now and then, when they do something good, I celebrate it. And this is something that they did that was really great. They listened to their fans and they have been listening to their fans and it's been cool. They've even tried to fix up their whole online purchasing thing, which I know has been a pain. But what's most important and what brought me the greatest bunch of glee, ooh, was when I started seeing all the memes about the sculptors being butthurt. <laughs> and that made me so happy. <laughs> I love that shit. I was like, fuck oh, Sorry. That, and everybody's got to make a, uh, make a living. I get it. But don't be like a pig. You know what I mean? Like, well, and a lot of sculptors are. The thing with the are. sculptors is, uh, and, and this is this is sort of hearsay, so forgive me if I'm not up on my facts, but a lot of the time, these aren't toy people necessarily. Like, no. there are there are kind of groups uh, that kind of suggest what are the kind of the, the must have like fan items. And so, I don't know, bored housewives and house husbands who are in target that day and happen to walk past an aisle and they've just stocked the vipers. Um, if they are part of these groups, they'll pick them up and flip them on online cells. Uh, yeah, sales that's what it things. is. It's just about money. It's not about, the, you know love for the figures it's or love personal. for the consoles or love for the, the whatever love for the comic it's book just like, i don't know it's, it's like, like a you an evil a toy five? grubber sitting on yeah. this empire of of, of cobra island yeah. it's just, it's just <laughs> someone trying to make a living toy. you know by yeah. uh, you know um jacking up prices um that like said, said, there are plenty of evil toy hoarders as well no no for yeah, sure that's, what I'm yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the thing <clears> it's, it's the force right there's tons of people that do it and do it with respect to the community and do it with some form of business acumen that is responsible to the sort of the economics of, of toy collecting, you know what I mean? Or the economics of game collecting or whatever it is in that space. And that's awesome. To you guys, I say, go for it. When I read articles about a 16 year old that's made $3 million selling, uh, sculpting PS fives, a part <laughs> of me is very happy because that's one thing, but you know, but when, smart when you're on kid. eBay, <laughs> smart kid, exactly. Cele you know, like that's smart, but like when you are typing in Baroness into eBay, you know, classified and you see them all being listed for like anything between 80 and $160. And some of the sellers is like, and this is not a real seller. I'm just using this as an example, but it's like Jody's collectible antiques. And, um, you know, oh, damn you, Jody. Like, oh God, I like, hope Jody Mama's doesn't pottery, uh, exist. Mama's pottery barn collectibles. You're like, really? She's got like a whole bunch of pottery and there's like freaking Baroness and like <laughs> and $160. You get what I'm saying? They turn up that in the most fun. unlikely places. That's where I've been looking for my Tiger Force Outback. <laughs> <laughs> also, um, on that um, note, somebody posted, I, I saw this, I had to just mention this, it's really funny. Somebody posted an eBay listing of Tiger Force Outback and... Um, it was on one of the G.I. Joe collector's things. Now, if you're a listener and you you might recognize the, the listing, the guy was actually saying, uh, yeah, I can see the crotch has been fixed and there's definitely been a repaint job on this. Actually, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that darker green pants for the Tiger Force Outback is the Argentina version, the Australia version, if I'm not mistaken. 
And that thing is probably worth three times as much as that guy's listening in, on eBay. Broken crotch or not. Mm. I had no Just idea Estrella did TF Outback. Um, I thought it's it was actually, a UK Euro exclusive. It's not it's not actually TF Outback. It's just you know like how they've got it's um, just Marujo? Like it's just that. Hmm. Kitty mm. shirt and all. Paul, pictures, or oh, it never happened. And with regards <laughs> to scalping, perhaps <laughs> when in doubt, quote, and this one comes from Toy Galaxy. If you see one, pick it up. If you see two, leave one for the next guy. Hell yeah. Hey, very smart. And don't do that care, toy fans. Yeah, and don't be and like weird with and y'all like... once again. Yeah. <laughs> also, um, and don't be that weird guy who like buys a figure, switches its arms, or takes out the accessories that you want, and replaces it with a Punisher figure or some crap, and then returns it to Target and puts it back on the shelf or whatever. Like, what is that? <laughs> um, gullible stuff. That's what that oh, is. Paul, it's just disgusting. It's disgusting. Attention. People need to be but better than that. But, what yeah. everyone should be paying attention to is Iconicon. If they're there are like dozens upon dozens of panels that have been recorded. I believe there's still a few going on today or as of our recording right now. Um, go which check will be them in out. the past when this podcast Which Which will free. be in the past. Yeah, so by the time you hear this, Iconicon will be complete. There are hours upon hours of incredible panels that you can check out. Go to iconicononline.com. Um, there's an entire schedule there, easily linked to any of the videos that have been produced. Um, they're definitely all worth checking out, and totally. and yeah, I hope I hope this becomes some, a yearly thing, an annual thing, um, or a monthly thing. Let's do it every month. <laughs> and also, like, <laughs> I think uh, that'd be fun for everyone, but the organizers. I think those guys <laughs> all deserve a big break after this. But knowing them, they won't, and they'll be hitting you with even more content. I don't know how those guys keep up to that <laughs> kind of schedule. It's impressive. Well, so I, have I, have to, I have a lot of new people to 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 actually watch on YouTube now, um, and yeah, I think it was an overall awesome experience. Thank you so much, Melinda. Thank you, Michael, and to everyone involved for organizing this. It was absolutely amazing, and I look yeah. forward to it to next year. Oh, on 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 the point of Michael, um, when we wrapped recording uh, uh, our. Arnie versus Sly, he came on, um, you know, kind of very quickly and was like, "Thanks, Rob. It's so cool to finally see you, to meet you, and and uh, and and you're the reason why I own a scoop now, and you're awesome." <laughs> so, <laughs> hell yeah, he was not I'll going to scoop. flub his chance to meet the mythical creature, the, the unicorn <laughs> that is Rob Lemmer of Geo. The Rob Corn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was a really cool moment, and, and thanks, Mike. Um, I'm glad you like Scoop, and yeah, um, hopefully they'll be worth a lot more money in the future if you do choose to sell it, because we're driving the prices up, just the way <laughs> I intended. <laughs> um, and to also, I'd like to also echo Rob's dip, uh, sentiments and just add to uh, thank you again to Melinda and and the crew. You guys are so awesome, so well organized. How, you know, I know. I can't speak of this too much, but I can speak from the perspective of having Steve uh, watching, having watched Steven organize a whole bunch of stuff when we came down to to Jocon. Um, it really is like herding cats, and you did it like super well. So Melinda, just high five to you and the team. You guys kicked all the butts. You know, we always knew we always had our green room uh, links. We always had our topics and stuff prepped. You you know you just made sure everything was like super awesome and you know when when things got a bit funny on some of the panels and when there was a bit of dead air you definitely helped and picked us up really appreciate it thank you so much and to all the awesome people uh, that I at least had a chance to to be in the panels with it's great meeting you guys uh, this is like this is a lot of names <laughs> um, but I'm now turned on to what you do I like Rob said there's a whole bunch of new YouTube channels for us to follow and check out and be fans of um mm. and it was great to meet started as acquaintances at the beginning of a panel but uh, by the end fast friends i think in totally i had like a whole and... bunch of friend requests on facebook it was great oh friends. Mm. friends and lastly friends. couldn't have happened without the people who came out and showed support anyone who watched anyone who commented whether it was live or on the replay thank you to our friends our fans our followers everybody out there new and old Yo, Joe Berg, everybody. Yo. And 
quick fire topic. Quick, 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 oh quick, quick, quick fire topic. Oh Quick, right at the three, end. Hey, right at if the you end, hung right in here, end. if you hung in here after all that sentimental bullshit that we just spouted, <laughs> firing back on some GI Joe content with a quick fire topic. Okay, quick, quick, Paul, quick, let's quick. have it now. Let's be super quick. Uh, just one, just choose one. Who do you guys want to have at the next Iconic Con? Like, who, who should they add? <laughs> who should they add? Oh my goodness. My my choice, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep to myself because. It's controversial. <laughs> oh, <laughs> use your imagination. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I would love if I mean are, are this is, is Form BX two five seven is he still producing content currently? It's less frequent. I think uh particularly during the pandemic, um Kevin's been you know, li- life does get in the way. It definitely it's, it's does. It's not a Jurassic I, I Park hope... situation of life finding a way, it's more like a case of life getting in the way. Then I hope next year with the pandemic, hopefully further, you know, less hectic as it is now. Um, I hope he can definitely be there. And HCC, yes, as as um, Andrew and, and Ryan have said, would be amazing to have him on there too. Mm. Totally. I would also yeah, love to Once have... again, life life notwithstanding. <laughs> I think both in, in the cases of Kevin and Brian, if they want to step back into the folds, we are so more than happy to have them. I'd also really love to have Carson Metaxas uh, of 3D Joes and 3D Joes, you know, there. I think that would be great as well next year. I think it'd be cool to have them there. Um, think- <laughs> We're just yeah. listing all the Joe guys. <laughs> yeah, I know, but like we're Joe no, guys, right? So, that's, we yeah. are Joe guys, yeah. But who is, who's that um, Transformers guy that you like to watch? Two, He'd two be Adams. amazing. Oh, two. yes. Totally. Yeah. yeah, and Kato. We need Kato. Mm-hmm as well kato would be awesome and yeah thank you andrew for for bringing kato up that's definitely another dude that we need up there I'm, yeah like we need him in there because my he's bad great. buddy zazel from sergeant slaughter's slaughterhouse Ooh, i mean not only was awesome. sergeant slaughter a gi joe but he was an icon of the 1980s and yeah. having zazel on a panel will definitely open the door to wrestling in the 80s hulkamania totally. everybody man Chris from comic shows, yeah. Yep. Uh, Gaz says Chris from comic shows. From uh, Chris, um, Gaz says Chris from comic tropes. That's what it sounds like in English when I say it. (laughs) Look, I'd be happy to see every single one of our pals from Cobra Convergence be kind of ported into this event. I don't understand if the logistics would be up to it, Um, but I mean, being a GI Joe fanatic first and foremost. (laughs) <laughs> if we just populated the event with GI Joe channels, <laughs> every would other panel would be a GI Joe big panel. Also, it'd be I mean, cool to get Spectre Joe Creative. <laughs> it would be great to have Spectre Creative um, there as well from the He-Man. Oh yeah, what's Mark, on your mind? Get Mark Webber. Their last live stream was a fantastic insight into what could have been the 2017 GI Joe product rollout. Like this was Mark and- Webber's pitch and. Man, if you're a fan of the the OG thirteen, well, you're probably equal parts happy and devastated that it never happened. And what also, uh, full force. you're completely devastated that it never happened because I mean, it was a beautiful plan. Check the podcast; it's their most recent uh, "What's on Your Mind." And also, Mr. Chris McLeod from um, uh, Full Force. It'll be great Good to have Full Force in the house. Amazing. <laughs> and, Oh, and I see Ryan has also just suggested full force. And then also, <laughs> I would like to be on the ultimate, definitive Karate Kid discussion panel. I must be there. Okay, then. That That's all. happening next year. That's happening. When we do it next time, I'm going to send Melinda a message after Iconic on and go, I would like to put in a request for a Karate Kid panel for next Iconic on. <laughs> and this is how I want to do it. <laughs> and as it. Matt, as Matt or Matthew from Matt Movie 611 said on my panel, I would absolutely love if they do a Kurt Russell panel next year and I'll be on that with Matt. Yes. I think that'd be freaking amazing. Mm-hmm. So Karate Kid, Kurt Russell, okay, a couple G.I. Joe ones. Maybe they just do a deep dive into the G.I. Joe movie. Um, Again, because we don't talk about that enough. <laughs> and uh, and with that, go and check out our cool merch <laughs> at eastpink.com. <laughs> Link is in the description below. And if you want to be part of our awesome crew, the Bergforce, come check out our Patreon. 
Uh, it's super, super, super cool. And I do all kinds of fun things like releasing a new song this week. Yay. Oh, sweet. Wah, 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 wah. Have I heard uh, it yet? Uh, you have. It's just at this time it will be uh, released to the public. So it's new oh. for them. I just remastered it. I just mastered it properly for them. So I'm keeping it a secret. It'll be a surprise on Thursday. So Heck yeah. Heck yeah. Cool. The future is bright, guys. The future is G.I. Joe. Hey, you fellas are the smokers in the group. <laughs> I, I don't know. Tai baby. Tai Chi. <laughs> <laughs> All right, lady criminals. Bye, everybody. It's just. Uh,